Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, I'm delighted today that my guest is probably Britain's best-known historian. Dr. David Starkey is well known to us for the numerous books that he's written about British history, about the monarchy, and particularly about the Tudors, and to a wider audience through the various series and documentaries he's made for television. He's also well known, I think it's a period of about three decades now, uh, for his various appearances on Question Time and Any Questions. I'm delighted he's with us today. Thank you very much, David, for coming. Um, you're on tour at the moment, aren't you? That's putting it very strongly. Um, I am suffering from the fate of every B or C list celebrity as you try oh. to monetize the ashes of your fame. And I troll myself around various obscure theatres talking to very agreeable audiences and earning a pittance. It's, it's a really, it's a modest, modest activity. Well, I came to see you when you were doing it recently and it didn't seem like it was a packed house. And I mean, I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit about this without giving away too much of your lecture, but this is a fascinating subject you're talking on, which is essentially Britain's other Brexit, its yeah. first Brexit. That's one of the subjects. I do several. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have lots of things up my sleeve, including one that I think is in some ways even more apposite to our present catastrophe than that, which is on why Churchill was great. And what I argue is Churchill is great because of writing a very important history book. Really? Writing on his ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, yeah, yeah. and what he does, he looks at the uh, relationship between, again, it's very much this question of the relationship between England, Britain, yeah. and Europe. Yes. And he looks at the relationship between England, Britain, because Britain is just a formal political entity at this point from 1707, and the France of Louis XIV. And what he does, he looks at Louis XIV and he's not quite sure what the modern analogy is. Yeah. He's writing this after the rise of Stalin, but before the rise of Hitler. Yes, it's in this yes. middle period. And what he's doing in that is saying, I know why Louis XIV is wicked. On the one hand, he is aiming for external hegemony, mm. dominance of Europe. On the other hand, he's an internal persecutor, yeah. the persecution of the Huguenots. And he sees this, the relation of internal persecution and the external pursuit of hegemony as the authentic mark of totalitarian tyranny. Mm. Now you can see, it's like Pirandello, six characters in search of an author. He's yes. looking for a modern analogy. Yes. And this is why he understood Hitler in a way which nobody else did, and as quickly as he did, because he'd already worked out the lineaments. So it's a jolly good lecture. Uh, yeah. The other Brexit, well, of course it's a good lecture. The other, one, <laughs> the other one is when the boot is on the other foot and we're dealing with a quasi, but it's very quasi totalitarian uh, ruler in Britain, which is Henry VIII. Yeah. And the lecture yeah. you heard is Henry VIII and the first Brexit. And what I argue there, of course, is that the break with the Roman church is absolutely analogous to our separating ourselves from the EU. It's even fought over the same territory. Yes. It's fought over jurisdiction. Yes. I mean, why does Henry have to break with Rome to get his divorce? Because England is subordinate to a European court. Yes. Um, what is the other ground of the conflict? The amount of money you pay. Yes, um, no, 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 no. Quite extraordinary. Um, and it, it, it goes into absolute detail. The way Henry does it is by the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, in other words, the idea which is being pursued hotly by the Legion of Remainers headed by Centurion Burko is that parliamentary sovereignty can be used to deny national sovereignty. Yes, it's an yes. absurd contradiction. Mm. Parliamentary sovereignty only makes sense within the notion of a sovereign independent state. Otherwise, it's meaningless verbiage. And again, of course, it highlights the fact that the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty long predates democracy. Yeah. And that the great crisis in Britain is that we've never worked out what the relationship between an idea of popular sovereignty and parliamentary sovereignty is, which was, of course, exposed with brutal effectiveness by the Brexit referendum. So th th that really is the nub of it, actually, isn't it? It really is the nub. You know? But I think there are several nubs. Um, again, you've got to ask um, why the various bits of the British Isles vote in the way they do. Mm. Why is Brexit a specifically English phenomenon? Mm. 
with Wales? The answer is, of course, Henry VIII. Uh, from the 16th century onwards, the notion of self-determination, of self-government, of separation from any, uh, any uh, external form of subordination mm. has been absolutely the central thread of English identity. Mm. It's why the British English Empire is the only empire in the world that spawns this series of self-governing entities. Mm. First the American colonies, then Canada, Australia, yeah. South Africa, yeah. New Zealand, and so on. With with the Henry VIII analogy, I mean, it, it, it we're talking about it, a different set of people entirely, aren't we? I mean, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 you'd noticed, have you? I, I, think I, so. I think this is a level of sublime perception. You've noticed <laughs> the difference between, say, Henry VIII and Theresa May, yes. have you? Yes, yes. Uh, there are some very interesting parallels, actually, in how badly Henry got it wrong to begin with. Mm. To begin with, Henry does exactly what Theresa May has been doing, and he does it for two years. Mm. He negotiates with Rome on Rome's terms. He uses a principal minister, Cardinal Wolsey, mm. who, by the way, was also fond of wearing red and had very large beads, right. and uh, didn't believe in the divorce, hated Anne Boleyn, and really wanted to keep England in hock to Rome. So he makes exactly the same mistake. Uh, except, of course, when the catastrophe of Wolsey's approach with the divorce is brought home uh, with the uh, papal, uh, the suspension of the papal court that had been uh, was sitting in England with the, with, the, with, the le with the cardinal legate Campeggio, when that's brought home to Henry, of course, he is not a 1922 committee. No, it doesn't no. take him an eternity to decide that Wolsey's got to go. Yes. And then at that point, this is where the stories diverge so radically, Henry stops, thinks, commissions research, mm. works out a series of rational grounds mm. for what he's doing. But of course, in doing it, in pushing the argument for the self-sufficiency of England, he really reinvents England. Mm. And I think that the, the, you know, the great impetus that lay behind the, uh, lay behind the vote is, is that sense of, an England that is different, an England that is separate, that has its own powerful identity over and against. I mean, some, some of it's terribly, terribly crude. Let me give you an example mm. of the final culmination of all of this propaganda from my own life story. Uh, I was the son of um, working class parents in the north of England, uh, very unusual in one sense in that they were mm. Quaker, is very unusual mm. for working class people. Normally it's very much the middle class at prayer, reading The Guardian, of course. Mm. Um, uh, but, but my mother was a slightly different variety. She was really just a northern working class Puritan. Yeah. And when I first, this was my first school trip as a newly anointed grammar school boy wearing my green blazer and my little cap, my first school trip was to Rome. Wow. The look wow. of Good Lord. horror on her face yeah. when this was explained. <laughs> I mean, because you know, suddenly all of these visions of the horror of Rome, the horror of Babylon, uh, the wickedness yes. of Rome, yeah. its corruption, she couldn't explain those. She thought she couldn't to an 11 year old child. So I can still remember the moment. Wash your hands. They've got very funny toilets. <laughs> but actually, David, that's, uh, that was quite unusual at the age of 11 then to be going on a school trip to Rome. No, it wasn't. It, no? Was, it was a little grad school. Right. But it was, I was probably 13. It would be, right. second, it would be the yeah. second year. But I remember vividly the trip, yes. uh, the trip across the channel, uh, wearing a plastic mat because the only thing that protected yourself from the vomit, you know, yes, <laughs> just uns unspeakable. And then roughly 36 hours crossing Europe by train, stop it. I can still remember the stop in Basel station, eating for the first time black cherry jam, which was jolly good, uh, and the journey through North Italy and the stink of the hard-boiled eggs in the packed lunches. It was a... Have, you, have you ever written about this, by the way? No. No? That'd no. be wonderful. And the way you're describing it there, it's be beautiful. My agent constantly says, you should forget the Tudors and write your autobiography. Well, <laughs> yes. We can't forget the Tudors for a minute. No. Um, Two things I, I want to ask you. You mentioned there this sense of England being different. Mm. Henry VIII, certainly to me as a, as a kid, and now, seems to kind of, doesn't he, he's, he's part of the kind of English folklore, he seems to... Mythic. Sound, 
somehow mythic. mythical He's mythic yes somehow seems to absolutely be the essence of Englishness to some people what is that then well, my great teacher at Cambridge, this is moving on to the next stage of my life, maybe the next chapter but two of the yeah. autobiography, uh, my great teacher at Cambridge, Geoffrey Alton, the only thing I can remember of sitting at his feet in umpteen lectures mm. was his comment on the great Holbein portrait of Henry, you know, yes. this one, yeah. uh, in which he pointed out that Henry VIII is the only king whose shape you remember. Henry it's VIII true, is isn't it? It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. Henry VIII is subliminal. Yeah. The Holbein portrait underneath all the frou-frou of the, the velvet and the cloth of gold and the ruching and the ostrich feathers and whatever is cubist geometry. Mm. You know? mm. Bodies are trapezium, legs yeah. are splayed, columns, yeah. arms are triangles, attached triangles. Because he's a rugby player, yeah. rug, you know, jousting being rugby on horseback, the head and the neck are a continuous cylinder. Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what yeah, the yeah, rugby yeah, player yeah, neck yeah, looks yes, like. Yes. And, and the little hat is the angle. So that goes into the mind. And of course what Henry VIII did, the six wives, it beats Bluebeard. Bluebeard's yeah, a bore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Henry VIII, <laughs> there is the immediate... And also ran, yes. the, 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 And also ran <laughs> in yeah, comparison yeah, yeah, with Henry. Yeah. So I think it really... It, the Tudors are the English Greek myths. They're the Greek myths of the, of the English world. Elizabeth comes quite close. Yes, it, she it, does. It, it, she's it, the English Virgin Mary. Yes. Uh, exactly, though, yeah. though I always say it's very important you understand she's a born-again virgin. Right. Have you my, my clever lady <laughs> friends tell me this is entirely possible. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> do you do you ever bother with the various film adaptations no. that there are? Do you never? No. I can't ask you which in, in no, Elizabeth no, no, you thought no, was best. No, 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 no. And um, not that I particularly disapprove. No. But I and nor nor you know nor do I read the Hilary Mantel's of this world. Not be, not because of disapproving, but I just don't see the point. Yes. I, I just remember in, in the Cape Blanchett Elizabeth film, this point is entirely made. She look, she says they don't have a vir they don't have a mother anymore. I will virtually I will become the Virgin Mary. Hence the white makeup. Hence all of this. Well, Virgin and Queen. Roy Strong, I mean, uh, who is brilliant on this subject, um, he points out that there are surviving engravings of Elizabeth I that have been turned into votive objects. Yes, they're bordered yeah, yeah. in paper lace. Yes. They're stained with with wax. I mean, clearly they you know candles have been put on yeah, either side of yeah. them um, and I mean Elizabeth is the moment at which the relationship with the monarch really sublimates itself into some sort of notion of submerging in a larger national identity yes. if you look under Henry VIII and you look at royal emblems for example the use of the Tudor coat of arms yeah. or the Tudor badges if you find those in a country house that's that's redecorated under Henry VIII say the, the, the best known example uh, of the two of them uh, one is item moat uh, a national oh, okay. trust house, mm -hmm. and the other is not open to the public. It's Compton Winyard, Winyards of the house of the Marquises of Northampton. Mm. That's built by Henry VIII's Peter Mandelson. That's built by the groom of the stool who oh, wiped right. Henry's bottom. Which <laughs> you know, I think is exactly the role that one envisages Peter Mandelson as having played. Uh, but if you look at both of those houses, they're mm. heavily decorated with yeah. portcullises, roses, and whatever, right. because the people involved are intimate royal servants and attendants. Yes. By the time you've got to Elizabeth, everybody's house. Yes, yes. It's become a statement of national identity. Yes. The monarchy has kind of nationalised itself. Before here recording this, you've just come from the uh, portrait gallery, haven't mm -hmm. you? Um, you know, when I was growing up, this was somewhere that meant a huge amount to me, simply because you know this amazing Tudor gallery that with these Tudor gallery, which is Roy Strong. We were talking yes. about it. It's his great achievement. And, and you know, again, it takes you into, I think, so much of the heart of being English. Uh, why do we care about the Tudors? Well, there's yet another reason. Uh, because of the first people that we know what they looked like. Yes, exactly. Yes. The, yeah. the, why you can't get too excited about the Plantagenets, amazing though they are, um, is because we don't really know what they look like. Whereas with the Tudors, you saw Henry. God, would you recognise him? Yes, Elizabeth, exactly. would you recognise yes, exactly. him? And I think that's, that's a central point. And it's also the dynasty which, again, it is this question of the definition of England. Um, the only other medieval king who has anything like that effect is Henry V. Mm. And what is striking is when you look at Churchill, talked about Churchill, when you look at the use that he makes of history. Of course, one of the uses is 
Henry V and Agincourt and whatever. But above all, it's the few. It's, the, as it were, the rerun of the myth of the Spanish Armada. Yeah, yeah. And uh, very strikingly, the great American historian, Garrett Mattingly, uh, was inspired uh, by the Battle of Britain to write what I think is one of the very greatest history books of the 16th century, his account of the Spanish Armada. Right. Um, and, and it's these myths yes. that come back time. And when we want to talk about a summit conference, it's the field of cloth of gold. Yes, the, the, yes. The, 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 there is this, it's as though the Tudors, who again, remember, have a totally modern appetite for fame, a totally modern flair for publicity, are also living and using and manipulating a media revolution, the bigger media revolution than even this stuff, yes. the revolution of print. Yes. So there are these wonderful echoes that go across 500 years. But, uh, well, for, for a young kid, right, that got me interested in history. It's simple as that. Seeing the Ditchley portrait of Elizabeth hmm. and this, the theatricality of it got me interested. What was it for you that started you on the journey of being interested oh, in Oh, it's much more prosaic. You obviously had a much more romantic upbringing than I did. Well, um, well, I was, no, I'm, 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 I'm not really, un, I, I'm not just teasing you. Um, I did history as second best. What was first? My first best was physics and chemistry. Really? Uh, I was the star in my little northern grammar school. Right at physics and chemistry, I did better actually, or at least as well as, as somebody who got an open scholarship in the natural sciences at, at the same time that I got one in history. But I wasn't a natural <coughs> mathematician. I see. And I had the wit to realize that. Yes. And for me, history is the subject which, with its use of evidence, with the, uh, with the trawling of sources, with the criticism of sources, has something like yes. the same yes. foundations as the natural sciences. Um, which is why I become furious at the modern attack on the notion of truth, mm. at the insistence that everything is just a matter of opinion. Mm. No, it's not. When did that happen then? When, when, when did you realise that actually you were going to go the historical way instead of... Oh, it was, it was after doing... It was, it, was, it was literally a decision on the eve of going into the sixth form. Really? As late as that. I see. late as that. Because the thing is, I mean, I don't know... The thing is, you've sort of become, in a way... You're one of those voices that is so distinct that it almost actually moulds the history in, in a way. I, I know that sounds terribly kind of, uh, you know... Fawning. Uh, fawning. 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 I'm fawning. fawning. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think that this is what is often lost now. I mean, these things have to be brought to life mm -hmm. and, and you have to convey without being condescending to people. Um, now, that's a really interesting point. I mean, I am passionately of the belief that there is nothing so complicated that if you actually understand yeah, it, yeah. you cannot communicate it in straightforward mm. language. Mm. And the great problem, of course, with so many subjects in the arts and social sciences is that obfuscation is mm. part of the mm. package. Mm. You know, the most obvious example is sociology, yeah. which is like medieval theology. It can only be taught in Latin. You know, at the moment you translate it, it becomes an absurdity. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, I've, I am so deeply opposed to that. Mm. I also had the great luck, I suppose, um, in that I've always been a dissenter. I was, well, I was Quaker parents. Um, I was the only boy in my class. This was literally, you were saying when you were questioning mm. me at the age 11. Uh, I was, uh, I, my first year at grammar school was the year of Suez. Right. I was the only boy in the class who supported NASA. Right, I see. Um, okay. And that kind of person. A very, you know, very really, popular position, I imagine. Really, at the time. really popular. <laughs> fortunately, I, I was at the same. I was more or less the same size then that I am now. So <laughs> any attempt at bullying was fairly vigorously resisted. Um, I remember one of my masters said, "You really should take up boxing," but I was, it never really appealed very much. Later on, I might have quite enjoyed <laughs> it. But um, uh, but what I what 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 I felt, and what I became as a historian was consciously going against the consensus yeah. of the 60s when I was taught. Yeah. When I was taught, you know, it was believed that the Russian Revolution was the most important event in mm. human history, mm. rather than you know, one of the periodic spasms of horror that the Slavic people inflict on themselves roughly yeah. once every 50 years, yeah. which is clearly what it is now, yeah. with Putin merely being you know, yet another czar. Um, and so I went against that, 
um, I rejected the notion that history is essentially about the mass and comes up from the bottom. It seemed to me always obvious that, it, and in this sense I'm a very good Bolshevik, history comes from the top. History is determined by small groups. Uh, the, English the English Reformation being an absolutely prime example, I went against, I've already paid tribute to my teacher, Geoffrey Elton, but I fought him every inch of the way. Yes. Here was this man who claimed that government became bureaucratized or depersonalized under Henry VIII, for God's sake. Yes. I can still yeah. remember teasing him, and he did not like being, he was very German, real name, Gottfried Rudolf Ehrenberg. He did not like being teased. So asking him, what was the moment at which he thought Thomas Cromwell, his hero of course, and Henry Mantel's hero, explained to Henry VIII that the king was now redundant. I reckon it was about three hours before he was executed with a deliberately <laughs> rusty axe and an inexperienced executioner. <laughs> you know, yes. But sorry, but what that what that led me to do, this is a serious point now. Yeah. What that led me to do was an interest in all the unfashionable subjects. Right. Monarchy. Yes. The court. Aristocracy. But of course, doing that forces you into a very different sort of history yes. from the usual political or social history. You're inevitably driven into the history of things. Yes, yes. I'm a huge believer in two key historical devices. One is the device of the narrative, which is also, de is also deeply unfashionable yeah, yeah. in the teaching and presentation of history. In other words, history is story. And I, I believe that it is actually the only way of understanding things. Until you know what happened, how on earth can you possibly understand it? And 90% yes. of the time, when you look at so-called analyses of the past, they're based on false narratives. So all my best books are extraordinarily dense engagements with the source. They don't read as though they're dense, I hope not. Um, but they are dense engagements with the sources, really teasing out what happened. And then, in passages of what's fashionably called thickened narrative, you then debate it, mm -hmm. but within mm -hmm. the narration. So there is that belief in narrative. My other commitment as a historian is the belief that these are real people mm. doing real things in real places in real time. That means you need to know about architecture. Yeah, it means yeah. you need to know about geography. It means you need to know about dress. It means you need to know about people's toilet habits, how they had sex, how they went, how yeah, they slept, yeah. how they ate. It, it, it's the French, of course, have a word for it. They call it histoire totale, total history. Yes. And it's very demanding, but I also think it was, again, this time fawning over myself. I think it's why in some ways I was a television natural, mm. apart from the ebullience of personality and the drama. No, I, but, I but, but also- Apart from those things, it's, a bit, it's actually, you, you've got to have a voice. This yeah. is the point. And I ha also it, have a very it, peculiar voice. Uh, there was, no, there but was a particular th point of view. <laughs> and, Indeed, and, and yes, voice, it, absolutely. You know, yeah. and, and the, but I think it is this, I call it thinginess. Mm. I mean, I've just written now, something I don't do very often, though I'm doing more of, going back to my roots as a clever research student, I've written a research paper on the royal finances of Henry VII, and I've revolutionized them because I asked the simple question, what actually lies behind these account books? Mm. Where was it done? Mm. Who was there? Mm. What do these beautifully flourished pages represent? And you realize, at least I've been able to show, that they represent actual specific accounts. How did Henry VII control his finances? By summoning his treasurer, the treasurer of the chamber, to court every quarter day, just like a modern business. Exactly. He's yeah, summoned yeah. there every quarter mm. day, and you go through the entire book, and you know what? How did the king make sure that those figures were accurate and that the treasurer, well, treasurer wasn't just doing like a modern fraud, producing an elegantly balanced fiction? Mm. because the treasurer then had to hand over the amount of cash that he said he had. All right, okay. Brilliant. Yes, yes With those yes, two yes, devices, yes, he yes. is the only king ever completely yes. before modern times to control the financial machine. David, if you, 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 I'm going back a bit when you said that you were, you've always dissented. Uh, in the academic world, you you were a, a teacher, weren't you, at the mm. LSE and all that. I mean, I would have thought that you would have certainly kicked against 
what I see as being like an orthodoxy there. I don't just mean in the academic sense, but actually even in the political sense, surely. I mean, yes, in, I mean, it, I think going back then, uh, politically probably less. I mean, I pulled out of full-time academic life 20 odd years ago, yeah, yeah. a very long time. Uh, I think, if again, I'm honest, uh, for much of that period, I was rejoicing in the newly developed gay activities of London yeah. and having a jolly good time. Yeah, and great. because I am a natural extemporary lecturer, I could be out enjoying myself till <laughs> four in the morning and still do a, a sort of 10 and 11 o'clock lecture and still be absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, I, where, where, how did I kick against the pricks? I believed passionately in teaching. Mm -hmm. I taught the wrong subjects. Mm -hmm. I also believed that everybody should be a serious teacher, mm. which many of my, I've just been having lunch with my former director, and he was describing his absolute failure to get my promotion through the academic board because they all hated me as I invariably came top of the student appreciation list, you see. <laughs> and this was regarded as being a bad thing. Yes. And one of the catastrophes with the universities is that we have falsely prioritized research. Yes. Now, I think research is very, very important. But the prime purpose of a teaching university has to be to teach. Yes, yes, yes. But yes. most academics aren't interested. They regard it as an unworthy diversion of their time from thinking great thoughts and getting huge fat research grants. David, you mentioned you know, about being a dissenter and taking on subjects that weren't particularly fashionable, like the monarchy. Um, I wonder... We've just had a royal birth. Mm. What if you believe? If you believe it, yes. <laughs> yes. I've just seen it. Yeah, there's been. You know, oh, apparently yes, it's yes, been yes, on yes. display today. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wondered what your, as I understand it, and as I've picked up, you don't have that much of a high regard for the House of Windsor, do you? Or is that is that unfair, sir? I think it's rather unfair. I mean, I think um, various sovereigns have played their cards with various degrees of effectiveness. I have an enormously high regard the first sovereign of the House of Windsor, George V. Yeah. I think the reinvention of the monarchy in 1917 is one of the great marketing exercises of all time. You know, mm -hmm. They actually market test the name Windsor. Yeah. Uh, the transformation of a German dynasty into an English family, the way you turn uh, a, an aristocratic institution that was held in widespread doubt into a symbol of sort of bourgeois earnestness and the best of British is genius, yeah, is yeah. genius. Um, on the other hand, I do have, um, and it's very unfashionable to say so, I am not entirely persuaded that the present Queen uh, is the greatest that we've ever had, which mm -hmm. is the fashionable position. Uh, I think that uh, she has tended to pursue a policy of the quiet life, mm -hmm. uh, save in the Commonwealth, about which she has been passionate. And I think it's no accident that Harry and Meghan have been wheeled into uh, participating in that. Uh, but I think the great problem is that the Queen has left the monarchy as merely symbolic. Do, do, now, yes. the problem with that is it's rather too big an institution merely to be a symbol. Mm. And I think our current political crisis illustrates the fact that the old, older role of the monarchy, the role, for example, that her grandfather, when the Queen came to the throne, she says quite explicitly, I want to do as my father and grandfather did. Mm. Well, she hasn't. Mm. They both were the ultimate well, especially her grandfather, the ultimate political referee. Yeah. So when it came to the great crisis of 31, you know, that yeah. long flowing crisis from the general strike and whatever, the second Labour government and whatever, it is George V who acts as the political referee, who is directly instrumental in putting together the national government. If you look across the channel, uh, now no longer saying England unique and whatever, but you look at the other surviving monarchies in Europe, they all have the role of political arbiter. Yes. And of course, it's a role which is very alive in many of those countries because they also have proportional representation, which means that each formation of a government is a work of negotiation. Yeah, yeah. And in almost all of them, under their essentially 1830s constitutions, the monarch is the referee. And um, I've seen it with people like Juan Carlos. So absolutely, it absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. You see it uh, with Queen Margaret of, 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 uh, of, of Denmark and so on. Mm. Um, uh, you, you see it with the sovereigns of the Netherlands. Um, and to have, a, and the British monarchy is bigger than them. 
Mm. It's the only sacerdotal monarchy that's left. It's mm. the only monarchy that practices full coronation. No, the continental monarchies don't practice proper coronation. No, they no, simply no. have oath takings touching the yes, crown. Exactly. Yep. They don't have anointing. Mm, mm. I mean, we are, we are the last of the great medieval sacerdotal monarchies mm. of which a shadow survives. That's too big just to be a symbol. I remember but but e equally, I am very aware, and it's obvious why she did it, because political intervention uh, in an age when there is a lack of deference, when mm -hmm. there is an aggressive contempt for one's social betters, a sort of leveling, leveling democracy, um, is, is difficult and dangerous. Yes, I remember going, what, 22 years ago now, I remember seeing you on TV after Diana oh. had been killed. I remember you being, in fact, I think you were on the very morning. I after. was indeed. I was the only person, let me finish this story. Yeah. I was the only person in London with trousers appearing on television right. because okay. everybody had been dragged out of their bed. At that time, the monarchy looked distinctly mortal. Oh, I mean, uh, collapsing. I mean, but in fact, sort of general anti monarchism was actually the kind of order of the day. Things have been Tony Blair's to Tony Blair's patronage, you know, yes. putting his arm round the Queen, yes. and Alistair Campbell, for God's sake, yes. uh, you know, sort of gently telling them how to survive. Yes, but now I would say it appears stronger than anything else. Anything else? I mean, where do you do you do you think it has a future? I, you know, I mean, I I I can't help but feel that there is some in some some of its functions it's sort of almost actually possibly increased in, in importance i you know if we're becoming more and more fragmented and all the rest of it there are very few things actually basically holding the thing together i mean isn't, isn't it just oh come on aren't you aren't you being very highfalutin doesn't it just survive, provide terrific material uh, for twitter and and the the right hand column of the daily mail um uh, which it, it, it does so. provide huge quantities but i think the reason that the monarchy looks stable is nothing particularly to do with the monarchy itself yeah. it's just that everything else has collapsed uh, yeah. If you look at the, you know, the division in which Parliament is held, mm -hmm. I mean, first the expenses scandal, then the scandal of the deliberate traducing of the verdict mm -hmm. of the referendum, the behaviour of the Speaker, the clownishness of the Speaker, you know, it, who looks like au bourgeois mm -hmm. uh, wearing a black gown, uh, the, the performance of easily the most incompetent premier we've ever had and the most undesirable leader of the opposition and mm. just and the again the questions over the behavior of the courts the collapse of respect for the metropolitan police you know you go on area after area after area yes i mean i find that so the monarchy i think yes. the monarchy is sort of last man standing or last woman standing yes i think it for me, you've gone through those institutions there, the civil service, all mm, the rest of them. Mm, mm. Since, since Brexit, it seems to me, I mean, I feel now that my feelings about my country have to be held in my head, as it were, because yes. of all of these things, which once one did basically believe in. I mean, I can ask you, I've asked other people, when, for example, we had this referendum, you know, despite all the hyperbole, I think most people thought look, ultimately they will kind of like pass it through. And I think people have been utterly shocked by the sheer level of betrayal, actually, I would say. Is that how you see it? I think it is absolutely true. But I think what you've then got to do, you have to ask yourself, how has this come about? Yeah. Why is it that one act, as it were, brought the pillars of the temple tumbling down? And I think my answer would be that the structure was already fundamentally rotten. Mm. Both political parties, first Blair, uh, with Labour, New Labour, uh, and then the Conservatives under Cameron were completely hollowed out structures mm. with minuscule memberships in which they had been taken over by a particular faction and it was a particular faction espousing a set of universal neoliberal values yeah. um, and of course Cameron catastrophically Cameron and Clegg saw Blair as the master politician I don't know whether you realize this mm -hmm. um, that Blair's oh, book yeah, was yeah. passed around mm -hmm. as gospel um, the heir to Blair. As, mm -hmm. as Blair mm -hmm. Blair was referred to as the master mm -hmm. and it's also very important to understand just how deliberately destructive mm -hmm. new labor was was. I mean, fashionable people uh, like Linda Collins, um, de demolition of the notion of Britishness, mm. um, that bizarre 
account by a, Pol a historian of Poland of the British Isles court, um, um, uh, uh, and so on, were, were, were held up within the civil service uh, as required reading. Mm -hmm. So you had a deliberate demolition of the notion of nationhood. What we know about, again, about, uh, as it were, rubbing people's noses in it, either with open-ended immigration on the one hand, or within the Tory party, at the enforcement of gay marriage on the other. These were all deliberate elite devices mm -hmm. to say, we're in command. Mm -hmm. You lot don't matter. You will do as you were told, and you will shut up. Yes, yes. And, and I, think, I think that what Brexit has done has torn the veil from people's faces. In other words, I think there were, absolute, I th I think there were mm. absolutely fundamental changes there before, which we sort of didn't really notice. Mm, mm. I mean, do, do, do you think... Do, how would, therefore, you characterise... I mean, I, I know that you... As an historian, you know, I know you don't like maybe looking at the future and saying, oh, this will happen, that will happen. But... I don't at all. No, <laughs> but this, therefore, is an extraordinary time of our history. It is. I, I think it's the moment at which two things have happened. I think the constitution as it emerged from the glorious revolution mm. is manifestly finished. Mm. It stopped working. Right. You could argue equally that that notion of constitutional development from Magna Carta itself has also come to an end. Really? I mean, you've got to ask the question, how is it that broadly we've avoided revolution? Mm. Why have we avoided revolution? Because in England, and we really should talk about it, the English parliament mm. that's just got a few bells and whistles stuck onto it. In England, the position of uh, those wanting a place in the sun, wanting admission to the political elite, you know, first the, uh, the, the, the entrepreneur and, the, and, and the, 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 the rich outside the charm circle of the aristocracy and the gentry, then the skilled worker, then women, and the whole thing. Every one of them didn't want to do what was the case in France or continental Europe. You didn't want to tear down the existing mm. structures. You wanted a place in them. So radicalism in England was a campaign for parliamentary representation. You didn't want to destroy Parliament, you wanted a place in it. And I think that what's happened with the referendum is the first time that Parliament has consciously and deliberately and led by its Speaker and by its leading MPs consciously reversed the notion of representation. And it seems to me to be an, an act of unprecedented folly and you look at some of those involved, they're, I mean, they're supposedly quite serious people. I don't mm -hmm. think Burkers. Um, uh, 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 okay. I used to think Dominic Grieve was. Um, uh, uh, but it's, it's a sort of act of institutional suicide. Mm -hmm. And it, as I said, it, ca it, calls, it calls the whole, and again, Burkos' behaviour, it calls the whole notion of an unwritten constitution yeah, into question. Yeah. But therefore, I mean, this... And even the call for a second referendum, yes. if there is to, which won't be a second referendum, it will be a third or fourth referendum. Yes. You know, we've had two about Europe, uh, we've had one about Scotland, we've had one about the electoral system. At that point, I'm afraid you then do have to define the status of referenda. Ooh. Mm. This is in basically leading us into a position where, you know, Brexit maybe it's just lit a fuse. Uh, you know, essentially it's a much bigger deal. I think it, it is. I think I th it's uh, much bigger. Uh, much bigger. And I think that, uh, the re again, the reason for the vote. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there, is, there is now this, ex and, and this is deeply unoriginal. This mm. is not an original observation at all. There is clearly an enormous gulf between a particular liberal elite mm. uh, in which certain things are totally unsayable mm. that actually most people believe. Mm, mm. and much of the rest of the population. Mm. Not all the population, uh, but a very significant slice of it. It's partly generational, it's partly regional, uh, it's all sorts of things. Uh, but Bre Brexit has acted as a kind of acid bath yes. or a burning lens. Yes. The thing is about the liberal elite is that there is, a, there is a feeling still that they not only haven't learnt any lessons from any of this, they don't want to. But, but they're doubling down. Almost. Of course, of course. I mean, I think, I think again. You see, one of the things that I think is extraordinary is with the loss of belief, with the loss of religious belief. Certainly, on the left, political positions have become religious. Mm. They're not arguments mm. about human mm. society. Yeah. They're statements about absolute values. This means, of course, if you disagree with them. 
you are not simply disagreeing. This is not a debate in which evidence is adduced. Yeah. You are fundamentally wicked. Exactly. We are yeah, now exactly. treating political yeah, yeah. opinions as though they were creedal formulations, yeah. which means to dissent from them is heresy. Yeah. And the only way that you treat a heretic is the way Roger Scruton has been treated. Yes. I mean, it was extraordinary looking at the Times editorial. Uh, he, Roger was accused, and it, it, in one sense it made some concessions to him, but then if you recall, it also said he owed contrition. What a word. That's a religious word. Yes, yeah. And what was it that he had to be contrite about? First of all, he had described uh, the Islamic masses threatening Hungary as tribes. tribes yeah. Well, I think they actually are. Yeah. Uh, if you actually look at how their societies are organised. Uh, so that's a question of fact. An even more evident question of fact is the second thing he was accused of saying. He was accused of saying, and I have no idea whether this statement is true or not, he was accused of saying that one of the reasons why social housing council housing has become contentious in Britain is because it is largely lived in mm. by uh, foreign asylum seekers mm. whose social habits are radically different from those of the rest of the population. Now that's a statement of fact. Mm. It is testable as to whether it is true or not. The Times didn't say that. It said merely saying that yes, sins, yes. let me finish, against social cohesion. Mm. Now I'm a believer, going right back to the beginnings of this conversation on history, Politics is partly about emotion, but finally it has to be about evidence. If w fact, if we do not have a politics that takes account and is based upon the actual realities of human behavior and our situation now, we head for disaster. We head for the world of, of a false fact and Plato's cave. And the terrifying thing about this world of the liberal elite, I think it's actually Plato's cave. I think it's a false world. It's a world of illusion, passionately held illusion. Do you think... As a conservative, I believe in fact. Do you think now, as opposed to maybe when you started your academic life, for example, do you think that the young people that you come across, that you talk to or whatever, do they have a, a, a far more tenuous grasp of our, of our story of they history? No, most of them have no grasp at all, unless they, unless they happen to be... I mean, the ones that I really meet have a very good grasp because they're fans and they, yeah, yeah, they yeah, love yeah, the sort yeah. of things that I do. But the general impression that I get is that um, the teaching of history, as dare I say, the teaching of virtually every other subject, mm, yeah. now seems to be fact-free. Mm. It's they're inculcated with opinions, it's received sort of, opinion. Isn't it this kind of experience thing? Like, I am a peasant in, it, in that sort feudal, of thing. Yes, what yes. do I feel? Uh, empathy, empathy, yes, empathy, 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 empathy. So um, as I was, I was running because of, as opposed to infamy, infamy, uh, organized uh, infamy. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I think that, <laughs> if only yes. Keith Williams were the teacher of the nation's <laughs> history. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, it has deteriorated teaching of history in what 30, 40 but years. But I think all subjects have. Mm -hmm. There is a shy, partly it's how teachers are taught. I mean, uh, the, the, the terrible notion that you need a certificate of education. The, the way, it, and I know lots and lots of people who think this, the way to improve education is to close all departments of education. Mm -hmm. They're disasters. What you want are teachers who are passionate about their subjects and can communicate them. Yeah. Um, and also, again, uh, there has been, de de in, certainly in subjects like history, there has been deliberate subversion uh, what I regard as a proper way of teaching history. Um, there has been again the influence of postmodernism, the attack on fact, the claim that everything is a matter of opinion. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. Again, students are encouraged, uh, children really, pupils, are encouraged to write opinionated essays when they don't know anything. Isn't this happening really now with science too? In a I way? don't know. It's sort of creeping in, isn't it? This sort of whole idea. I mean, certainly in things like climate change. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there again, it's it is terrifying. Um, you listen to allegedly significant scientists, and they're making totally non-scientific statements because it's become a creedal belief. Mm -hmm. And it's it's when you know, what should be a hard science uh, becomes really. Uh, a campaign for funding, mm. a campaign for political, specific forms of political action, that contaminates. It is no longer 
a scientific discipline. Mm. It's yet another piece of political posturing. Do you, just to finish off, I mean, do you now, I mean, do you, what do you feel about Britain now? I mean, do you, do you feel more optimistic, given that we are talking about these changes that have been wrought by Brexit, do you think this is something that is will replenish and revive this country, or do you think this is actually something that's going to a make final it spasm? Uh, do you know what? I don't know because I'm not a prophet. Mm. I mean, I think there are very different outcomes possible. Mm. Uh, I think that the conscious attack on the idea of nationhood, the deliberate denigration of British history, mm. the, which is very interesting, this whole attempt at moving slavery mm. to the center of the story. Mm. What this is attempt to do is to say that British history is as corrupt as German history. Mm. Uh, of course, the Holocaust has ceased to be useful now uh, to the left as a moral reference point because they dislike Israel. Mm -hmm. And there's now this very powerful flavour of pro-Palestinianism, pro-Islam and uh, anti-Zionism. Uh, so, but also it's useless because it doesn't attack Britishness. Mm -hmm. The Britishness uh, is really the last uncontaminated nationalism to survive the Second World War because we didn't suffer the crisis of defeat. Yes. And therefore, the great enterprise of the left is to destroy it. Yes. And the attempt is using Brexit, uh, sorry, the attempt is using slavery to say that British history is fundamentally corrupt. Mm. It's of course an absurdity because A, every other civilization and every other empire practiced it, many of them on a much larger scale, mm. but the uniqueness of the British Empire is it destroyed it. Mm, mm. You know, the, and, and, it's, and it's fascinating that my own university, Cambridge, has jumped on this, led of course by a Canadian mm. uh, who rejoices in the name of Toop, I say it should be Stoop, um, <laughs> uh, uh, bending the knee before these people. Uh, the absurdity of it is of course Cambridge is the pioneer abolitionist university. Yeah, yeah. It's actually a vice-chancellor's yeah. essay that Lee in the 1790s that leads to the first formulation of abolition in intellectual terms and then it's picked up by William Wilberforce of course who is a Tory mm, you know, mm. but this doesn't fit the narrative mm. no it, it is you a, want you want a self-flagellating narrative mm. but I think this is profoundly dangerous and we are peculiarly mm. vulnerable to it as we are to Brexit because British identity and nationalism is a very peculiar one it's not about national dress we don't have one. It's not about national music. It's not about, you know, Burns and all that sort of boring stuff. Mm. It was always about institutions. Yes. About the sense of political continuity, of the excellence of our politics, of the, of, of the quality of our law, uh, of the strength of our society. And once you start attacking all of these, you're actually destroying the fabric of social order. Yeah. It's not simply a political attack. You were tearing apart the very fabric of a nation. Now, it could be, in a, the best of all possible worlds, Brexit, if there was somebody who could lead, and I don't think Farage is the man, if there was somebody who could produce a generous, open, welcoming, as Britain always used to be, is still outstanding in its record of the absorption of minorities, in the prevalence of, you know, interracial marriage, all of these things. Extreme. London's the most welcoming, open society in the world. Um, and, but there needs to be a formulation. I mean, if, the, if, if, if Brexit is to be, a, if Brexit happens, which I think is now very unlikely, um, uh, if it actually happens, there needs to be a politician who can do a Churchill on it. Yes. Yeah. In other words, we need a politician who understands it, who can formulate it in a language which touches, which is comprehensible, which embraces, which involves. And we have nobody, nobody at all. There's this deafening silence or the stutter or the flicker of, you know, shallow eyes going over an auto cue. Mm. On that note, I mean, it's, it's a rather depressing one, but nevertheless a truthful one. Um, where can people come and see you, by the way, doing the tour? Where can they find out about? Oh, I'm terrible. I'm not even sure I've got a web page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm a political knife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much for giving us so much time, David. And um, thank you very much for watching uh, So What You're Saying Is. Please do uh, subscribe. It's totally free. You can just subscribe by 
pinging on that button there. Okay, see you next time. Thank you very much.